I call this meeting to order. The, uh, this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department uh, Board of Commissioners being videotaped at the RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Mass. This meeting is being videotaped for distribution to the community television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. I also want to read our code of conduct. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment to the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda, as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair, and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chairman to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. So with that, uh, just introductions. We have our representative from the CAB here tonight. Welcome. Dennis. Do you want to uh, add anything? Or? I'm good. OK, Thank very you. good. Um, we also have a, I have a request from uh, the public to, for a public comment. Mary Ellen, if you want to come up, please. So that cable TV can can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> you know the drill, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Ellen O'Neill. I live at 125 Summer Avenue in Reading. I am a current and longtime member of town meeting, a former member of the CAB, a former member member of this board, and former chairman of the board. And I wanted to talk to you tonight since it's. Um, you are considering the tree trimming bid. It's not about the bid in particular, but it is about the tree trimming program and something that I would like to ask the board to consider in its new budget year. Um, so almost three years ago, when a new company, um, my understanding, when a new company was uh, given the tree trimming contract, uh, changes were made in how the trees were trimmed. More was taken, the span is wider. And as a result, there was a lot of um, unhappiness, in, at least in the town of Reading, about what was happening to some of the street trees with the, the new um, approach. It's not unique to the RMLD. Um, I think the IOUs are doing it. A lot of municipals and other you know, utilities are doing it. I actually called the um, <clears throat> person, the staff person, down at the Hingham Municipal Light Plant where my son lives and knowing that they have a big tree cover down there. And they're having similar problems down there. Actually, it sounds a little worse. There's a lot of conflict between the um, Hingham um, Municipal Light and uh, their DPW with how the tree trimming is going. So in, in the tree world, any cuts on the trees, small or large, are considered wounds. They're actually a very great stress on the tree. And the more there are and the deeper they go, the more stressful it is for the tree. And all our street trees under, are under stress. Their location, the multi-year drought that we've been facing, climate change, they're just under attack. Uh, in addition, some number of trees have to be taken down each year for various reasons. And um, so what I would like to ask the board to consider and when they get after the first of the year and start to prepare the budget and look at fiscal year 19 is to consider um, some compensation I have to look at as compensation for what's being done for the to the trees in order to accommodate and I and I understand you know to improve the reliability statistics and electrical service that we increasingly depend on um, to keep that running more smoothly you know this is the way it's going but I think it would be fair and just to consider some compensation um, for the trees and setting aside some amount of money to give to the municipalities to, um, you know, plant some substantial trees in their communities. So that's my request. Okay. Any questions? No. No. Okay. Sure. Very good. As we go good. forward, you should consider it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. We will. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you, I this evening. I looked at the board pack. It's all extremely interesting, and I wish you a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Don't you miss it? it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. What I'd like to do now is uh, not do the board minutes, but skip to item six, which is the presentation of the audit, and ask Frank and uh, Zachary to come on up and make their presentation. <laughs>
Good evening. My name is Frank Byron. I'm the president of Lanson Heath CPAs, and this is Zach Fentros, who was the audit manager for the department's audit this past year. Uh, we're here this evening to walk through the highlights of the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30, 2017. The actual work for the audit uh, was, was accomplished in uh, mid to late August this year, but unfortunately things got delayed um, and the audit wasn't able to be completed because of a new accounting standard that came out this past year dealing with uh, the treatment of what's called other post-employment benefits, um, GASB Statement 74, which required the actuaries to provide a report based on the department's year-end books. So the actuaries couldn't complete their work until the department closed its books and then there was a compression issue dealing with the actuaries trying to get a lot of reports done for not just this department but uh, a number of municipalities across the Commonwealth. So as a result, that actuarial report didn't get completed until last week, and therefore the financial statements, the audited financial statements, didn't really get completed until this week. Uh, the, the results of the audit, however, um, in our audit opinion, we have what's called a clean opinion. These financial statements are, in our opinion, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, and that's the best opinion you can receive from an independent outside audit. The department's financial statements are in very strong financial condition. Um, instead of walking through the detailed numbers, I think I'll just give you some highlights that uh, your overall cash balance is in a very strong position with about $15 million, which is about two months' worth of cash flow. So that's your operating cash. But you also have other restricted cash reserves adding up to about $29 million. So you, besides your operating cash, you have a, a very strong balance of other cash reserves. Your receivables are current. Uh, the department does a very good job at collecting its receivables. And substantially, all of the receivables that are on the books are under 60 days old. You have no long-term bonds payable. So the department funds all of its capital additions through the rate structure, through um, just the, the normal budget process without having to issue any bonds payable. So there are no bonds payable on your books. You do have a pension liability um, of about $12 million uh, because of your participation in the town's contributory retirement system. Uh, the town's re retirement system is about 73% funded, which is very good. That's better than most uh, municipal contributory retirement systems in Massachusetts. Typically range in the you know 50 to 60% range of funded, and you're in the 73%. Uh, Besides that, though, the department has another. Uh, five and a half million dollars set aside one of those restricted cash accounts is what's called a pension reserve fund that is set aside for future pension liabilities so even though the pension liability per the retirement system is about 12 million dollars you have almost half of that covered in a restricted cash account in your books there's a the, that new GASB that I mentioned before, Government Accounting Standard Board 74 and 75, which deals with other post-employment benefits. The actuaries determined that the overall liability for the department for retirees' health care benefits is about $10 million. However, the department has about $3 million set aside in a restricted account. So that, that makes the <coughs> net liability about $7 million. In next year's financial statements, that new standard, GASB Statement 75, will require that $7 million actually be reported on your balance sheet. It hasn't been required to be included up until now. So that, that's going to be a, a, a larger liability next year. The operating results for the year, the uh, department had a profit of about $4.5 million. It's limited by... Uh, the mass DPU that you, you can't exceed a profit of more than 8% of your capital assets. That $4.5 million comes out to under 8%. It's in a closer to 7.5% range. 
and uh, the prior year was about a three and a half million dollar profit. So you, you had a very profitable year. Um, so overall, just the, the financial statements are what would be considered by um, the bond rating agencies or anybody evaluating your financial statements, your financial statements would be considered to be in a very strong financial position. Zach, maybe you could speak about the condition of the accounting records. So um, when we come out to do the audit, the, uh, when we came out, uh, the accounting records are in fantastic shape. Um, normally with some of our other communities, uh, there's about maybe 70% of them have a management letter. Uh, the Reading Municipal Light Department did not have a management letter and has not had a management letter uh, for the past few years. It's been uh, pretty consistent to show that the town takes their, in or excuse me, the department takes their internal controls very serious and does a very good job of implementing them and making sure that they're operating effectively. Uh, and then also I'd just like to quickly thank everybody involved in the audit. Um, when we come out, the staff is always uh, very well prepared and they're very pleasant to work with, which really makes our job uh, much easier and it makes the audit go much smoother. Yep. Yeah, Zach, I, w I wondered for our listening uh, audience if you could just explain what a management letter is so they understand that. So a management letter, so in addition to what Frank was talking about with proving out the, um, the balances on, on the financial statements, we also look at the internal controls of the department to ensure that assets are properly safeguarded. Uh, and if we were determined that um, an improvement could be made, we would formally recommend that in a management letter. Um, and, and we didn't have anything, nothing came up uh, this year that we would want to formally recommend uh, in a management letter, which uh, is an impl uh, implies and says that uh, the department's internal controls are operating effectively and, and they are well maintained. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just to give the report of the audit committee, the audit committee met uh, both the town audit committee and the board subcommittee on the audit committee. Uh, met before this, uh, this uh, meeting tonight at 630. We heard a very much more detailed presentation uh, from the, the, the auditors at that meeting. I think all the board was there, with the exception of Mr. Talbot, who's in Brazil. Um, I think all the board members were there and heard the presentation. And basically, the uh, both committees voted to recommend to accept the audit and to recommend that the board accept it. It was four to zero for the town audit committee and two to zero on the subcommittee of the audit. So, if somebody will make the motion, I will accept it. You want to make the motion? motion. Go, go ahead. Uh, move that the board of commissioners accept the audit report from Melanson Heath. The school year ended. June 30th, 2017, as presented. Is that second? Second. Then move to second. Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? That motion carries four to zero. All right, very good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Very good. Thanks. See you next year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the June, the item five, I believe the June 15 minutes, I don't think I approved them, so they're not there. Yes, that is correct. Bad boy. Okay. Uh, so let's go to item eight. Item eight, the report of the chair. Um, the only thing I, I did attend the CAB meeting, which we'll get to, is the next, the next item, uh, and I'll cover that. Uh, the subcommittee on the return to the town of Reading did meet. Uh, we had some discussions as to... Uh, what each side maybe what we, we had the, I made the presentation that the board has seen before on the structure of the RMLD uh, on that um, and uh, there was some discussions as to uh, some preliminary discussions as to what the town actually was trying to achieve and what they were what they were hoping to get uh, at this point um, the attendance of that committee was there were two CAB members uh, myself and Mr. Stempeck representing the commission and then Dan Enzinger uh, was representing the Board of Selectmen were at that meeting. Um, and basically at this point, the discussion will be is to be continued at this point. There were no decisions made, nothing to be discussed. It just was exchange of ideas that took place. So, John, any, that, anything you think? No, I think that pretty much uh, does cover. I think there were, it was very fruitful, and uh, mm. um, both uh, uh, groups uh, understood what the need was, and we are exploring... Uh, different mechanisms and ideas about how to meet the needs mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, of the town as well as the uh, yeah. uh, using the resources of the RMLD. Okay. Yeah, and my understanding is they're supposed to make a presentation to town meeting. My understanding they're just going to say the discussions are ongoing. Good. As to what my my understanding of the discussions they're going to have at the uh, at, at the town meeting that's coming up next 
in fact Monday, Monday night. So, okay. Um, CAB meetings. I intended the CAB meeting uh, also. Um, basically, the two highlights on that was the the integrated resource division presentation, which you're going to see under item 11. So I'm not going to go into that in any detail. And the other thing, I just presented the uh, financial structure to them that the board has seen from before, before too. So um, that's pretty much it. You want to add anything? Uh, we finally not have a full board again with um, the mm -hmm. addition of uh, Vivid on the uh, from Winfield. Yes, so very good. That'll be the that's first great. meeting. That was the first meeting we actually had everybody. Great. Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Let's go to item 10. Colleen. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have Joyce uh, Mulvaney get up first and just give us some updates on uh, uh, community um, efforts. Thank you. Uh, just a few quick updates for the board. Uh, we held the Public Power Week open house on the 5th of October. thought it was very successful. We had over 300 folks in attendance, so very good turnout. Upcoming events, we have the elementary student art contest that's ongoing, so we'll have the award ceremonies in um, January. Uh, dates haven't been determined yet, so we'll let you know on that. As far as other efforts, uh, the calendar is in process, the historical calendar that will be distributed at the end of November. Okay. We're going to be holding the holiday light decorating contest again this year. Uh, that will be starting after Thanksgiving and go through the month of December. Uh, we're going to be updating the website to uh, provide a new, cleaner look and feel, easier navigation. It will be much more mobile friendly, and that's going to launch in the spring. And we're going to be doing the high school art contest again this year. This year we're going to uh, target the spring semester, so we'll do the awards ceremony towards the end of the school year. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Good job. Good job. Thank you. The, uh, and some of those pictures, I believe, were used in the annual report. Correct. That's correct. And I, I, I just want to say I, I thought they were fantastic. They were really, I mean, almost professional quality. I, mean, yeah. I was really surprised by them. They did a great job. Yeah. yeah so I'm looking forward to the town meeting when it's on a big screen. Big yeah. screen. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be fun. Um, okay. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, I was going to give um, uh, Chairman Pacino had asked me to give an update on uh, the storm that we recently had. Uh, the total amount of customers that actually went out was 2,617, of which uh, Wilmington 190, uh, Linfield 350, uh, North Reading 402, and 1,675 in Reading. Now the majority in Reading was due to a feeder outage, which lasted about two hours, and that feeder was the 4W30 on High Street, Middlesex Ave, and Main Street. Um, every single one of the outages was tree related. Large trees coming down, snapping poles, wires on the ground. Um, so we, our Twitter um, stats, there were 72 tweets issued on um, updating customers of, you know, that the outages were identified and, you know, we were trying to post restoration times. I just want to remind the public that, you know, when large trees comes down, comes down we're not able to get in there right away. A lot of times we have to hire cranes to come in and a lot of tree work has to be done before Redding Light can even get in there. So we tried to do everything in a safe manner. Um, our control authorities and engineers did a wonderful job, the crews. We had um, mutual aid. Uh, we had called for some mutual aid to help us. Um, a lot of areas here got hit. So there wasn't a lot of people available. There's a lot of utilities whose um, maybe their extra employees are down in the Caribbean still trying to support the hurricanes. Um, so we were able to get um, Concord, um, Littleton, Wakefield, and um, who else came in? Um, one other one. Yeah, Concord. And then we, um, we had one contract crew. So essentially there was only, let's see, Marion Street, Murray Hill, and Wilmington was the largest area outage with 120 customers, and Morningside at 40 customers. Everyone else, the other five of them were just small transformer sizes. And Linfield, we only had one major out outage on Summer Avenue. Uh, again, tree on the primary lines, that was 320. Uh, North Reading, 
we had a couple of large ones, Oakdale Road, um, Ma, uh, what is it, uh, Abbott Street, and then uh, Linwood and Southwick were all over 100 customers. Um, and then in Reading, other than that feeder outage, the largest one was 20 customers on South Street, which um, uh, was substantial damage with the trees and the poles in that area. So overall, I think we did very well. We, uh, we had everyone back in power well ahead of a lot of the other towns and systems, so we're very proud of that. We're very grateful that we were able to get some mutual aid in here to make sure that our employees got proper rest. You know, with dealing with electricity can be very dangerous. So um, overall, I think it was, a, um, you know, it was a storm that was well handled and um, we appreciated everybody's patience. And where we don't have an outage management system yet, Hamid is going to be demoing one next week and we're hoping that by uh, within the next three or four months, by the spring, we're going to have a full outage management. And, and so it would be very similar to looking at an IOU, perhaps a map, showing the area, areas that are out and a lot more information going back to the public. And uh, we appreciate that with the software we have right now that in Twitter we're, we're doing the best we can to try to get that information out there. Okay. I noticed that, um, <clears throat> if I may, the, that the, uh, there were a number of sleeping cots in the, in the boardroom. I thought for, for a minute we were going to an Airbnb model. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, clear, well, clearly they were there for a long time and going right. to the night. Yeah, typically we have this room and, and we have a couple of quiet rooms because we'll, we'll work 16 to 18 hours and then we have to put them down for six and then we try to rotate on fresh legs uh, to make sure. And even when we get mutual aid in, we have to account for how many hours they may have worked in their town so that no one is really exceeding that. Um, you know, some utilities may push their employees really hard, but we really want to focus on their health, the safety, and you get better safety for the workers and the public when, you, when you're following you know, OSHA recommendations in, in um, our um, safety program. A question, Colleen. Uh, you touched on how when the new system comes in place, there'll be more and better information to the public. Can you highlight that a little bit more about um, what kind of things yeah, they might expect? Do you want to get up and just sure. go yeah, and just, uh, oh, maybe the use some words with the, the demo we're going to be seeing? So the new outage management uh, system, it's uh, integrated with the AMI system, the mesh network. So anytime the customers are out, so that it's going to send a signal to the outage management system and that's going to show that you know those customers are out so if you look at the gis map you're going to see uh, the feeder out or how many customers out and you could see exactly where which streets they're out and how many and then you know we can get the outage statistics that way a more accurate way to capture you know when the customers are out and when they're coming back on uh, and then what we do, the next step is we're going to have a integrated worker management systems and the travel tickets that being issued for those areas that are out. So the crews, they're going to be dispatched exactly to the area that the trouble is. And as they pick up the customers, you're going to see those turning back on and, you know, the meters are coming on. So we know that the customers are back on. <coughs> it's very uh, smart system. And it's going to help the dispatchers and also the customers to know exactly what the situation is and where are the troubled areas. And uh, the customers who are actually are signing up, they could be texted, they could be emailed, they could be, you know, that uh, all sort of capabilities, if, uh, which basically is going to uh, do what we're doing tweeting right now, except at a more detailed level. That's great. Can I ask, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, will they be able to see a visual? I haven't seen the demo yet. So will they be able to see the visual on a, from a map? They're going to be able to see the visual like, you know, what you see in National Grid and other utilities. You know, this year what we're going to do, we're going to be in F FY18. We're going to be installing the basic system. There are some options that it's going to be added. So. The, the demo that we're going to have for the management, they're going to discuss about the options that we're going to have to add the following year. But yes, you're going to be able to see the demo on, on the uh, map, basically. 
Right. And the people actually, you could see that from your tablet or, you know, from your uh, iPhone or if. So a resident could see, okay, yes, they could see that. my neighborhood is badly yes. hit or yes, not. Yes, they okay. could see that. We could even uh, dispatch, you know, we could even send pictures through that so the people, they could see the extent of the damage. And uh, it's very, very smart system. So we're looking forward to have that. That's going to be helping us with the outage management much, much better than what we are capable of doing right now. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. Very good. Thanks, Amin. Yeah, I, th I think we were, the system was up pretty quickly, those outages, well beyond, well ahead of some neighbor, some of our neighbors to the north. Yes. That's uh, right. Especially that, that are right. owned by uh, some other entities <laughs> <laughs> that'll go nameless. Okay. And I, I think it's a tribute to the, the department for getting the things back up and running quickly enough. And I think the board, I speak for the board that we express our gratitude to the to the employees, the department, and the, the management, and the employees for getting the system up as quickly as yep. they did. I'll pass that along. And I ask you. that you pass that along. Yes. Yes. Will. Thank you. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Very good. So let's go to the integrated resource bill. You're up. Hi. I was told by the uh, cable TV technician that if I talk loud enough, everybody be able to hear me. And <laughs> okay. Um, I'm uh, going to go through some highlights for. Uh, September and October, hopefully some points of interest. Uh, this first slide is taking a look at the, the peak for the summer day, just the peak day, the fuel pricing within ISO. And slide, this slide here shows you what all the day ahead pricing was and what the fluctuations were. So the high out of the three years that we were looking at here, 2015, 16, 17, would be for say hour 16 and on August uh, 12th of 2016 at right around $100. Um, compare that, these are all day ahead prices. If you compare that to where the pricing was in the real time, uh, some of those prices actually exceeded $400 right around the same time, a little bit earlier in the day. So what that tells us is <clears throat> that we want to have as much of that power locked in in the day ahead, which is what we strive to do um, without forecasting and the bids that we put into the market. Um, so I thought that was uh, a fairly interesting uh, uh, slide to uh, just So, Bill, if I may, so we're basically purchasing at $100 per hour as opposed to as having as real. As long as, our, as long as our forward forecasting is accurate for those days. Right. We try to we try to put in as accurate a, 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 a forecast as we can and lock in the day ahead. Right, so that's that great. It doesn't always work. Uh, for, for whatever reason, July of 2015, the pricing just was it was pretty flat. So day ahead, real time, it really didn't matter. But you really don't want to risk that it's going to be there. You'd rather try to go for uh, go for the safe. The mm -hmm. safe. Uh, this slide just sort of shows, attempts to show you that our, our peaks, which is the, the little red line, actually are coincident with the ISO system peak. Um, so the more we can, can do, to, the, the, that the light department can do to control our peak and reduce that, uh, effectively should uh, reduce our uh, costs in the power supply. On the power supply um, this slide, this slide's a little tricky, because um, what, it, what it depicts are transmission costs, and I think we've been, we've been telling the public and telling the board that this year, 2017, was the year where uh, you know, transmission costs were going up along with capacity costs. So since this year's costs are the highest per kilowatt month, you would, you would think that 2017's costs overall for the month of September would have been higher than they were in 2016. But the peak was so much higher in 2016. It was over 20 megawatts higher in 2016. That, that's why you, the, the cost part of it uh, comes in a little bit higher. And then this slide just gives you a, a, a fair, fair view of how pretty much energy prices as a whole are still on the downswing historically. Uh, all, each of the three months in the summer, every year, show that the price of uh, basically natural gas prices are still on the downswing, um, even though ever so 
Morris is trying to tell us different right now because they want to raise their rates. Um, it's still on the downswing. Mm -hmm. Classes are down um, this year as compared to the uh, previous uh, two years. And this slide uh, just shows that uh, we weren't saying that we weren't telling you the sky was falling. Capacity costs really are high this year. It's the, there's a significant impact to the rates, um, even though overall our, our uh, capacity load isn't increasing exponentially, the costs are going up, and that's because uh, the slide shows you that that's uh, that really is the case. And that was because of the infrastructure uh, investment that was made by others, is that it's correct? Actually, um, because the, if, if, if you go by what the ISO says we need for generation capacity, specifically in, in our zone, mm -hmm. um, we're constrained. There, there, there's a lack of it. And until they finish all of their transmission upgrades and get, I believe it's first light the, that took over with Salem, that, that, load, that generation that really should be there now isn't there yet. Once all of those things uh, come into play, um, it should relieve a lot of the constraints in the area. And the, the, predict, the prediction is that the poor capacity market prices are going to go down. We know they're down for the next two auctions going out to 2018 and 2019, but they should stay down because we should have enough generation and transmission infrastructure in the foreseeable future, anyway, to sure. uh, help try to keep those costs. Thank you. That's what I had for uh, the uh, IRD slides. If there were any other questions. Question? No. Good, good presentation. Yep. It's fine. Thanks, Bill. Should we go on to the uh, risk management strategy? No, I'll ask permission to chime in. This is uh, the same presentation that was given to the CAD earlier. Uh, and, um, the objectives for this particular uh, presentation are to uh, show you how, um, with our current strategy, we're um, going to upgrade it a little bit and hopefully show you to demonstrate how this particular type of uh, strategy should help mitigate risk, keep the rates stable, and uh, really improve the way that we'd be able to lock in pricing at an optimum time and uh, help secure lower, lower costs overall. Um, as I think all of you folks are pretty familiar with of the layered and the layering strategy that we've had um, pretty much for the last six or seven years. Um, what, we, what the department's done is uh, typically put together a process where we annually go out for uh, pricing and stagger how much power we're buying. With the majority of, of um, the purchase being within the first year, and then it staggers in the increments all the way uh, moving forward for four years, so that we always have this layered and, and, and laddered um, set of pricing, which hopefully gives you a smooth curve. Um, that, that that's that's what we're attempting to do. Um, we're not locking in all of all of the power supply. We're only really looking at areas that aren't already covered with either contracts that we already have in place, um, our Stony Brook entitlements, our Stony Brook entitlements. All of that has been uh, pulled out of the energy needs that, that we're looking at. So we're just looking at all of these open positions going forward. Um, we're hoping that with this new approach, we're just going to fine tune how, how these purchases are made. So as I just uh, said,
said, we look out every four years and we secure uh, pricing after we make a presentation to both the CAB and the board on how many megawatt hours basically we're looking at over that four year period and what the estimated pricing is going to be before we lock in on that and we're looking at forward price curves in order to give you that information before we look to you for that approval and then we go through the process of uh, going out for our RFPs to get the pricing. Um, it's a, it, it's a limit, kind of a limiting, um, it limits us because we're trying to do a lot of, a lot of purchasing all at once. So it takes up some significant staff time up front. Uh, there are significant uh, legal costs involved because there's contracts that have to be negotiated before we can lock in on the price. So th there are areas where this new process is going to allow us to help mitigate some staff time and uh, legal costs moving forward. So those are all pluses. And it also does provide the value dollar cost averaging, which we'll get into a little bit later on in the, in the, uh, in the uh, presentation, to help build this portfolio that's uh, smoother and with the goal of being at, at or below uh, final market costs. So this, this just gives you a little bit of a, a background on over the last four, four years where we've been with purchases and what prices they got locked in. Um, All really uh, at the time that they were locked in, fairly competitive pricing. Uh, some of it's still good, uh, but it was all locked in and into all at once. And as we go through this uh, presentation, you'll see where we could take some advantage, take advantage of other prices as they fell by not basically taking that whole chunk and locking it in at once, but trying to take off small bites. And that's kind of uh, what this slide uh, intimates is that what we want to do is look at smaller pieces over time and try to take advantage of where the market is when, it, when it's lower than a four-year average. And it's kind of, it, it's a very regimented type of an exercise that uh, logically should give you a, a low cost over time. And if you're familiar with the stock market, it's cost average. It's basically split into two different types of triggers. You're either looking at, well, you're looking at both, but you're looking at price, and you're also looking at time. If, if, you, can't, if you can't take advantage of the market at a certain price, what this exercise does is tell you, well, you've got so much time to take a look at the prices, and then it forces you to block in something anyway, so that you're not just leaving your open position open for too long. So there's dates to look at, and there's also a matrix with pricing involved. And to be perfectly frank, this is not anything that um, We've actually done this in the past with heat rate index contracts. We, the, the department's done, done contracts where that same philosophy has been used. We set, set up the contract and then look at pricing and times to walk in different tranches. So uh, we're pretty much trying to set up a portfolio just like a heat rate in, index contract. This is a, an example of the matrix where your price trigger for instance, would be if you're if you're looking at a certain amount of megawatts for we'll take 2018 as the current year, and if if the pricing happened to be within that 10th percentile, which means that 90% of the costs are lower, you'd lock in pretty much that whole batch that you were looking for at that time, and then you wouldn't have to look at 2018 anymore. If it was only in the 50th percentile, you'd lock in 60% that first year and then tear it over to uh, each year after that. 
Bill, was that an algorithm that was developed here at the RMLD, or is that? No, this is yeah. something that, that actually has been, it's, it's utilized by municipal utilities. That's great. has been for, I, I think the some yeah. utilities have, have been doing it for a while. Is it software driven as well? I mean, do you have software to work with to help you do it, or is that not, is it more of a manual process? Um, well, this actually, I don't mean to correct Bill, this is not a sample. This is actually the price trigger matrix right here. Yeah. And, um, and we'll probably be asking uh, Nextera and others to be helping us because we're going to be, like, like Bill said, instead of locking in everything at one day during the year. Right. Sure, yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're refining it by requesting approval of a matrix that bases it on four-year averages. Um, and then you're you're having people actually help you that are at daily trading desks, and that's all they do all day, mm -hmm. so that they're giving you the price signals, and then we say yay, yes or not, but we're we're following that strategic guideline. Well, it seems like a great system. I mean, it mm -hmm. just to to get the lowest cost for the, yeah. the 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 maximum amount of kilowatts in the future. So. The, the division. The, we're working hard to come up with the strategic visions of, of how to stabilize rates and, as Bill said at the beginning, what the objectives are. Um, and um, it, it seems to work well. So I, I think it will work well here. Right. So again, if, those, if, if the price trigger doesn't come into play, then the time trigger does come into play. Mm -hmm. You only, you only want so much of your position open at a certain time. And so if you're, tw if you're tr looking out 12 months, you want at least 25% of that locked in. And you just keep moving down and so that within three months of the time that you've got that, you should have all of it locked in. Right. So, Two degrees of freedom. Yep. Right. Um, and again, just to emphasize, we just look, these are for the target This is a, this actually showed, is an example of why this type of a strategy is, you can take advantage of prices. If, if, if you had been locked in um, when, the, when the market peaked at what it, almost $150 and, and not let it roll down to when the market was at its lowest at 60.94, it's not the end of the world, but it isn't, it isn't the, the best price that you could have locked in at. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not to say that you're going to lock in everything at that 60, but you would have been locking in methodically portions as they became lower. So you're going to get a lower price than right. you would, if you would struck on the day of the highest uh, point. But that's really crucial because otherwise our electric bills would be two to three times higher, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So again, just to recap, um, a consistently applied risk management strategy is going to get rid of the speculation, and it, it just gives you a methodical approach to uh, help uh, give you a stable power supply. It should uh, allow the RMLB to take advantage of price opportunities. Um, it's going to allow us to secure monthly qualities that are below, hopefully below the four-year average versus locking in all at once. And uh, by using these time triggers, it should smooth out um, any variations and fluctuations within the power supply uh, over time. So if there's no other questions. Uh, okay. But Bill, maybe you explain to Mrs. So you went out five years in, in your new matrix, is that right? It, it goes out four years. Okay. Because I thought your price trigger shows years two, three, four, and five, right? Well, as you go through time, yep. you're done with your four years. Oh, it's a rolling four, okay, okay. yeah. If, if one year rolls off. The yeah, year okay, rolls yep, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. And just one question on the the variability of that chart. I mean, you know, the energy is 
provided by energy generators, right? So they must be targeting a certain capacity. So what this implies is that the capacity isn't used at certain portions, times in the future, or demands is just not there for some reason. You know, it, in a theoretical universe, you'd, you'd provide just enough power that yeah, uh, you'd, well, you'd uh, right. There's a lot of if you look at if you look at any utilities power supply, the seasonality variables. Mm -hmm. um, we, do we want to have as much power in, in um, say the month of November as we would in August? No. No. So that's why you have that. That's another great reason to actually look at smaller chunks of the power. Supply. Sure. Um, when we show when we show a vendor our load sheet, we're showing a monthly megawatts, and they are bidding that they are bidding on that. So there is that variability. That's a okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion. I read the motion. Sure. Uh, move that the board of commissioners accept the risk management strategy as presented and authorize the general manager to enter into purchase power agreements that satisfy the criteria set forth in the risk management strategy. As a matter of protocol, the department will provide a report on transactions relative to this strategy. Was that second? Second. Mr. Moon seconded. Just for information, the CAB approved this same motion and recommends it to us by vote of five to zero. Okay. Any discussion? No. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed? That motion carries four zero. Very nice good. job, Bill. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Bill. Bill. Thank you. Okay, Hamid, we're back up to you. Yes, the, the report, my report is from July through September 2017. Uh, the first slide, you see the, the report on the construction portion of the capital authorization projects. Uh, and year to date, you see that, you know, those numbers basically tells you how much we've spent and what was budgeted on the uh, FY18 and the uh, remaining balance, whatever that's left. You see that, you know, the projects we're making good progress, we are picking away at them, and that basically shows you the details of all those projects. The last, uh, mm, the last uh, item on the first slide, it's a routine construction, which we spent about uh, 279,450, and the second slide shows the details of the routine capital construction projects for those three months that shows you uh, uh, the activities, basically. Uh, the next slide is the capital improvement projects continued. Uh, the number of projects that uh, were uh, actually were uh, budgeted and the board approved them. So we are uh, moving those projects along and the station upgrades that we've done. And again, the numbers, they show that, you know, well, we are making good progress. Uh, some of them, they're ap approximately 99% to 100% completed. There's some that, you know, they're uh, working progress. And uh, the remaining balance on the last column shows you that, you know, how much money we have left to do. Uh, one of those uh, very important projects is the Station 3 reactors that you see, project number 138. We just got the materials, and the construction is going to start in uh, the spring. So. There's a bit that uh, you're going to be voting on for the construction of that uh, at, at the end of the presentation. <coughs> the next slide also moving along, the system projects and capital purchases. Again, uh, that shows the financials and how much money we're spending. So uh, that, that that is, if you have any questions on those. Uh, I got a, a report on the GIS on project number 125 that the GIS project is not completed and 100%, the data collections, everything is completed. And that was basically the basis that, you know, and the base for the audit management system. We needed that to integrate it with the, uh, with the AMI mesh network in order to get the audit management system working. And now that we have both components now, uh, then we're going to be able to move on with the audit management system as uh, Colin explained, it's going to be ready sometime in February, March. 
so that goes into productions. And we're still installing more and more meters as a part of the Eaton Mesh Network to expand the mesh so the system becomes uh, more uh, uh, stronger and more apparent. Uh, the next slide also shows uh, the facilities, the IRD and the IT department activities uh, that you see on the, uh, uh, this slide, the spendings, the year to date and the remaining balance again. Basically, all the projects are, uh, we are moving along. Uh, the next slide shows you the year to date that uh, we budgeted uh, $7,685,521. And year to date uh, on, on the previous slide that uh, the spendings had been uh, $1,329,244. And we got uh, approxima approximately $6.4 million to go, uh, which this is only for three months report. The next slide shows you the routine maintenance. These are the maintenance programs that we uh, have. Uh, uh, we, we started, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, the, the transformer replacement program uh, through the month of August, we had about 26.68% of Padmont transformers replaced. These are the age transformers that we are replacing. And the, the overhead category is about 18%. The pole inspection, it's going well. Uh, actually, they started the pole inspection, uh, they're going to start it as a Monday. So we're going to have another 650 poles uh, that they're going to be tested as our routine maintenance program. Uh, <coughs> uh, quarterly inspection of the feeders. These are the feeders that you see that uh, quarterly we, the crews, they keep uh, patrolling the lines for and they're looking for any sign of, signs of trouble. And if there are, then we take care of them. So they capture the, 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 the so we are not gonna have a premature failures. Madhole inspection program is going well. Porcelain cutout replacement, again, uh, we still uh, got few more that we gotta do as we are making uh, improvements uh, in, in uh, replacing the old infrastructures uh, in both overhead and underground categories. So you see that, you know, these, the number of these porcelain cutouts that you have in the system, they're decreasing and they're gonna be going away. Uh, we've got 249 remaining to be replaced, which uh, as we're making these uh, construction upgrades, they're gonna go away. Uh, tree trimming uh, is going well. Uh, substation maintenance, we haven't had any issues, no hotspots basically in the system uh, that as you know every month we uh, infrared all the stations looking for troubled spot hot spots as well as we um, infrading uh, the parks for uh, the major parks like river parks and ballot uh, areas and we haven't had any trouble or any problems on those areas the next slide shows you the debit poles. Basically, the ownership uh, is 50-50. We got about approximately 16,000 poles. The custodial of uh, Reading and North Reading, there with uh, re the North Reading is fully RMLD. Reading is split with Verizon, as you see on the map on the right. Uh, the Linfield and Wilmington is the custodial is with uh, Verizon. Uh, the next poll shows the double poll conditions and also the transfers. In Linfield, we got five. In Reading, we got 27 transfers, 64, 65 polls that needs to be polled. Uh, Reading, uh, we have 13 transfers and 31 pool polls. And uh, in Wilmington, we got 29 transfers and four uh, poll bots that they need to be removed. Overall, system-wide, we got about 74 transfers that we're going to have to do, and we are polling the poll bots, about 100 per 100 of them they have, they have in the system that we are removing. We got a good uh, program for removing these, the, these poll bots. Uh, basically, we're trying to uh, get 10 uh, done a week. Mm. So, but this is a moving target, as you could see, that you know, well, as we're making more and more upgrades, you're going to see more and more of those double poles, so uh, we we taking some down and we they are adding more to the system as we're making these system improvements. Sure. So all in all, we're making good progress on those. In North Reading, we had about, like about 90 that we 
brought them down to uh, 80. And now we got still some more that we need to take care of. Uh, as, and as you know, there's going to be a surge anytime you have storms as the poles, they're coming down and we have to, you know, you're going to see more and more of those devil poles, which we uh, take care of in, in a timely manner. The next slide shows you the reliability indices. I'm sorry this slide was a little bit late. It was done the last minute. You have to copy of those because we are migrating to the new Spry Point uh, work order uh, system. And uh, the, we couldn't recapture all the outages uh, in a timely manner. Uh, we're still working uh, to fix that. Uh, and like what I said, with the outage management system, once we have them, we're going to have them almost on a daily basis available. So you see under the reliability indices, the SADI, KD, and SAFI, we're all on all those categories. We're well below the national uh, and regional averages. So we are uh, doing good. That's, that is just through September, right? That's I mean, through September. They'll probably right. kick up a bit after the That's right. storm. After yeah. the storm, obviously, they're going to go up a little bit, but yeah. we're still going to be on there. On average. Good. Yes. Great. Good. The next slide shows you the outage causes. On the right, you see the averages uh, for the five years from 2012 to 2017, which the major categories uh, of the outages were equipment, trees, and wildlife. And on the left, you see the 2017 year to date, September, the equipment, trees, and wildlife. You could see that, you know, the equipment, we're going down. Uh, as the cause of the outages, as we're making these improvements, replacing the aged transformers and aged uh, equipment and upgrading them. So it, uh, it has made significant contributions to our uh, indices, lowering the outages and reducing the outages and therefore be well below the national and regional averages. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. If not, that concludes my report. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Um, I got a quick thing. With the tree trimming, you, you guys now go back, what is it, eight feet instead of the five. Right. But if you look, the average from 2012 to 2017 was 4.58 per month with trees. Right. And now, for the three months, you're at 11 um, per month for trees. So you're spending money taking cutting those trees back, but it right. seems like you're increasing your but issue with the trees before the storm even happens. Because this doesn't include this past storm, right? Well, this does not. It, it, it doesn't mean that you know, it, uh, they, they just uh, they, they, the trees that they coming down. These are not just for the uh, the, the, the tree trimming program that we have. Mm -hmm. These are the uh, well, even though we've had number of uh, uh, storms also, not including this storm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as the wind blows or, you know, you, they bring the branches down, the, uh, the pine trees, they still we have lots and lots of pine trees along the main routes that they're coming down. And even if you have a 10 miles uh, per hour wind, you know, they, they, they're, they, if they're not strong, the roots are not strong, they're still coming down. So uh, the trees are kind of tricky. Because, you know, uh, you could have an excellent uh, tree trimming program, but it's still, you know, depending on the situation and where the storm comes. And yeah. if you have other incidents, they still could come down and, you know, they could uh, make significant damages. Lots of private uh, uh, property trees that they bring in down, you know, these, they're, they're not, they're approaching line. We cannot really trim those. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have had a lot of those issues with the private properties. Uh, mm, and we cannot get into those uh, to trim the trees. Yep. We can only do the main lines. Okay. So they make significant contributions to the outages as well. I, I think if you look at the total number uh, as opposed to the percentages too, it, it shows you're absolutely going in the right direction. If you yes. look at the equipment tree and wildlife for the average over right. that five year span, right. it's about 163 right. outages versus just in the 2017, it's down to 99 over those three. So that's a pretty substantial reduction overall. So it's a combination of the yeah. all three, right. so. And what's the um, unknown seven? Like, what, what do you consider an unknown? And now are the ones that, you know, well, we don't know what really caused it, you know, but it's, um, it's not trees, it's not equipment, it's not, you know, no motor vehicle accidents. And it just happens, you know, 
it could be due to any reason. Uh, sometimes when you know there is an outage, you get there and you expect to see an animal on the ground, and you know if it's animal, you could call it, it categorize it as that. But sometimes there are unexplained. It could be the, the equipment that got weakened and then all of a sudden let go, and uh, or it could be the premature failure of the new equipment that you put up. Put up. Do you experience you many surges um, in the system? I mean, I, you know, you know, people talk about uh, sunspot activity, for example, right. and one of the major impacts is on utility lines. Right. The major utility lines that are coming across that cause huge surges whenever uh, something from the sun bursts out right. well beyond where it's supposed to. Do you see any of that? Or we haven't that seen that m much, but, you know, anytime there is a sun flares or anything like that, we get the MCC L2 alert from ah. New England ISO. Okay. So we know that there is a trouble in the system. So we watch and we monitor that from the SCADA to see that, you know, whether if there are any uh, voltage problems or if there are any right. surges on the system. We could uh, capture that through the SCADA system. But uh, generally, we haven't had much trouble on If I can ask one other thing. Go ahead. Just a curiosity thing. Like on a storm like we just had, how do you prioritize between the multiple towns and which one, where to, where to go to first and how to attack Well, those? the priority goes with the feeder. If the feeder is out, I mean, the feeder starts from the source, from the substation, goes to the feeder, and then goes to the lateral taps. Yeah. So if the feeder is out, it def definitely there's a problem at the substation. So you need first to take care of the substation, the breaker, and take get that going. So... Basically, what we do, we isolate all the t side taps, and then, you know, we t patrol the main line, look for troubles. If there are no troubles, you hit the breaker, you bring the main line back on, and then you get to the side the street, and, you know, you see if the fuse popped up, then, you know, you know that that, that area was in trouble or the, uh, or the fault was in that area. So you try to take care of that and bring them on. And, uh, you know, that's how we, d we, we, we go about. And obviously, uh, the, the areas that, you know, uh, they, we have uh, substantial damages. And we, got the, we, we see that, you know, it could impact the main line so we can't just hit the breaker to bring them back on. Mm -hmm. They take the priority over others. Yeah. And if the wire is down, arcing on the, you know, uh, on the uh, ground, so that should definitely, for public safety, Yep. should be considered as a priority and we do that we don't have many of those you know but uh, that's how dispatchers as they calls they start coming in we start logging and then we send people out to investigate to see what really caused it and then we start putting them back in in that sequence and order so that new program you're getting in would allow you to see all that and yes. react <clears throat> faster from well yes and no if it's a main line is out, it's going to take a while to patrol and find out exactly what the problem is and fix it. And then once you bring the backbone of the feeder out, uh, back in, then you're going to be able to get to the laterals and, you know, start picking them up after you remove the faults and after you fix them. Yeah. But once we get to the uh, other component, which is the smart grid, which we are implementing and I guess you guys saw the uh, presentation from Chattanooga uh, yep. back in, you know, in uh, right. NEPA yeah. conference. Yep. You could see that the switches, they could automatically isolate. They call it the FDIR, fault detection, isolation, restoration, which means once the fault hits, you know, that uh, system be isolating the section that is faulted mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, close the, f uh, the uh, backup feeders to the open points and that could be done within a matter of seconds. But right now, we are doing it manually. And that means if there is a trouble out in the system, <coughs> somebody needs to get out there and we need to patrol, see <coughs> what the problem is. <coughs> so that takes time for, for the trouble man to get out there, identify the problem, and then we're going to have to write switching and proper switching to isolate it. So that process is being done manually right yep. now which could take um, minutes to, hour, uh, to hours, depending on the extent of the damage. Uh, but once we have that uh, FDIR system, you're talking about seconds wow. that you know. Mm. And then the system is going to send a message to the trouble man that the fault is between switch one and switch two on Summer Street. 
and then they could be dispatched exactly to where the problem is and that's going to cut down really cost substantially so thank you we are moving in that direction yeah thank you you are We've got a couple. Thanks, mate. Got a couple of uh, procurement requests, approvals. Yes. You coming to tree trimming? I want to make one statement. I got a. Uh, the department sent me an email that was sent by one of a bidder on a project to introduce himself to me. Uh, the statement I want to make is the fact that the department has a has a procurement process right. of, of, of approving bids and and reviewing them, and I expect and the department and it should be followed. So. Anybody who wants to introduce themselves directly to me is wasting their time. <laughs> okay, with that, tree trimming. <laughs> sure. The tree trimming, we uh, had a bid out, and we sent a bid out to a number of bidders. We had only two uh, companies that they responded to the bid. One was Davy Tree Experts Company, and the other one, Mayor Tree Services. So the lowest responsible, responsive bidder was the Mayor Tree Services. Davies, uh, they didn't take any exceptions, but once you started going to the more detail, you saw that you know they took really exceptions, but they hit, the, they, they checked off the no exceptions. Mm. So they, they took many exceptions, and some of the exceptions that they took it was they didn't provide us the document uh, that we requested, like the listed employees that they, 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 they assigned to the contract, the copies of their uh, certifications and licenses, the OSHA, 10 CPR, first aid, the formal safety program, they didn't provide the number of aerial lifts and uh, cheaper trucks, they didn't provide that. So uh, we requested all of those, making sure they have proper equipment. And uh, the year and manufacture of the equipment and the statement of additional crew ad availability in case there are outages. So they did not provide any response to those and therefore uh, they were not eligible for that this uh, mm. uh, mm. bid. Uh, but the uh, Mayor Tree Services, they didn't take any exceptions. They have all the equipment. We've had exceptional, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, we're receiving exceptional services from them, really. We were very happy with their services. And they provided the crews, the, 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 the certifications that they required and everything were in place. So the reason you see that there is no number in there because you know we have uh, the number of variables that you can't really put down that how much and what, what it's gonna cost. We have uh, for FY17, we have in the budget $852,000. Uh, we don't know, for instance, how many storms we're gonna have and how much money we're gonna spend in storms. Um, when they cut, they cut based on the uh, the thickness of the branches, whether it's six inches, 12 inches, or you know more, so that the price varies. So for that uh, reason, we cannot really say that you know how much what the price would be. But the price, the the cost differential between the two was eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand dollars mayor was a little bit more over the period of three years, which is basically down to nothing with the type of services we get from them. So uh, that's what makes uh, Mayor Tree Services a responsible, responsive bidder uh, for this and this contract. So uh, just a suggestion, Mr. Chair. Sure. So I'm wondering, uh, just so there's some tie to the numbers, could we insert a not to exceed number? So whether that's the 878, because otherwise uh, from a I mean, obviously, you're not going to spend a million dollars or two million dollars, but I'm just wondering because otherwise, the uh, I guess what we're approving is just that we're going to use them for tree trimming, which I guess is okay. But I just, I'm wondering, maybe others have a comment. If would that be appropriate to, to have a not to exceed number and then at least, uh, you know, you yeah, not well, not to exceed uh, without reconsideration, right? In other words, if there were 15 storms in it. Yeah. As opposed to a normal year of five. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It gives us the open or the, the, the ability, the flexibility to uh, approve additional funds for for it, but after review. So I, I agree with you. I think that having a some kind of number in there would probably be a good thing to. Well, whatever yeah, I mean, number we have. Obviously, we're not going to have a problem yeah. with the staff because yeah. they're going to come to the board if they have an issue, but it's just from a a governance point of view, then, so we're not just making a, an approval of a 
what could be a three times three x number, right? Because the, the essence of a bid is we're approving expenditure, right? In this case, we we can't because we don't know how much it. That's right. You know. So what do you what do you want? Do you want to put that in the motion? You're saying? Well, I'm just throwing it out for consideration. And, just others, if we, I don't know. If yeah, I think. Do we have that? other things that we buy that don't have limits on? I was it. Is there other things like that? that we, well, I think we have nature, agreed upon, you know, price or contract, but it, there isn't really a limit. Well, I, I guess from a devil's advocate point of view, so we're spending eight hundred, maybe seventy-eight thousand dollars. So, but. We're not saying that here, so anything of that magnitude, you'd obviously want to. So, if, if you want to do that, then does that help? Just, or just the motion. Let me let me just give you the motion. Then the motion that we have in front of me is move that bid for tree trimming be awarded to. So after the word awar awarded, we would put in in an amount not to exceed eight hundred eighty thousand dollars around the number R. Yeah, but I like John. So maybe with John's comment. yeah, not to exceed eight hundred fifty thousand dollars without review by the board. Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen anyway, but I'm yeah. just saying from up. Okay. So that'll be part of the... Does that work for you, man? Yeah, yeah, that works. Because we pay them per span, yeah. and we are pretty much happy under control. What we, the only thing that we can't control and we don't have any control is yeah. storms. Okay, so just... All just of a sudden, in one storm, you know, you could use, uh, you know... Um, Cully, what do you okay. think? Yeah. Uh, well, that's three years. So... How would you like me to, you want me to come to you when we get to be 70% and say, based on what we've spent, we may spend more? I mean, we didn't do this the last time, um, oh, yeah. but I mean, I understand what your point is. I'm just wondering if, if you're, you're putting a value in for the three-year contract. Um, well, we could let... We could let you just manage that, right? So, so we don't need to know whether 60 or 50. I mean, you, you're going to manage the number anyway, right? Yeah, but what she's saying, if we go over the $880,000. And there's a storm. What, 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 is she, what, what do we got to, what do we want her to do? Do you want me to come to you like. Yeah. Three, three months before the end of the third contract and say, I think I might be going over? Um, well, that would be ideal, but I'm not sure that would be your. Focus as a general manager, right? Right. And so you well, do other things. Exactly. Well, I mean, the other side is we can approve it as stated, but maybe I guess we should just give some consideration. Uh, I mean, I just think naturally with a bid, you know, you're you're, looking, you're tying it to some, an expenditure, right? I know why we can't. If that helps, I could provide you the numbers uh, on a monthly report to say that you know how much yeah. we are. If that would give you an indication yeah, of maybe how I, much I, I thought there were other things that we had uh, approved that are like an accumulated number, right. Right, not to exceed over a given year number of transformers or whatever right. it may be. And but there's got there's some kind of stopgap uh, in the actual procurement process that says when you get that number, it, then you have to reconsider it. Is, isn't there something in the purchase process that allows that, or is it manual? It's generally what the purchase order is set up for. No, so, so you could have a not to exceed number on the purchase order, yeah. right? Yeah, we could have that. And oh. I think on the Mass General Law 149, which trees trim would fall under, I think you could, you're allowed up to like 10 or 20% over something. Or like you go for bid, you get a number. Isn't there a certain percentage you can go over um, on something like that? Yeah, because there's so much variable built yeah. into it. I mean, there's so I a... The law allows right. you yeah. a certain percentage to go over opposed to... Right. Um, just saying, okay, I have 880,000, but right. something else happens. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's fairly controlled by Mass General Law 149 or 3030B or 38, that is how they purchase everything. Mm. Well, I mean, the other, if you think about it, because obviously you got bids, for <laughs> right, and you're making decision based on the bid, so couldn't you just tie the, the, the bid number with, the, I mean, the understanding is that, you know, obviously uh, you may exceed the, <laughs> have to exceed it if it's uh, more storms, right? That's right. That's right. So in a way, you know, you're trying to match the the the, the bid because otherwise, I mean, if I'm uh, if I'm Davy, you know, I may want to show up the next meeting and say, wait a minute, <laughs> well, what was the bid? <laughs> you know, you didn't approve. Uh, 
You know what I'm saying? What, you know what? Well, we did the bid analysis based on the numbers that, and we went based on the average numbers, yeah. <clears throat> and that's what it showed. That yeah. No, I, I understand the problem. I guess so. I, I guess my, my only <clears throat> slight discomfort is I just we we have a process. We made a bid. I I, I think part of the to, to Dennis's point too is if 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 running the business requires us to spend more than the bid. You know, that's it's not because the, you know they've re increased the price. It's because there's been because you can tie it to the, the price per yeah. units and stuff. It's based on the fact that you had more work than that originally planned. Right? So they didn't bid the total. They just bid the spans. They bid stamp spans, and there were a number of factors uh, that they considered. Uh, I don't want to make a big deal, so it's for uh, if yeah, everyone else is fine. Uh, like, how many different things did they have to bid on? I mean, is it like? They bid 50 on different the things spans, or the price per span, the average price per day for eight hour span, the hazardous tree removals, which they go by the diameter one and a half inch, six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, 12 oh, inches, 32. And the hourly rate for the crews. So, total together, those, uh, you know, for year one, year two, year three, we made a comparison between Davies and, uh, and the mayors. Oh, and thank you. we went by the average uh, past two, three years, what the average number been. And we plugged them in. Mayor Tree Services came uh, out at $878,000. And uh, Davies came with those, the, the same numbers, that uh, the average numbers <coughs> for each category came out to 870000 mm -hmm. Almost identical. Yeah. Almost yeah. identical, yeah. yes. Three the years. same for, for, you know. Yeah, but they couldn't meet the other specifications. So. No, they couldn't. Right. They couldn't make the other. So what if we do this? If we add the word somewhere in here at the various race as specified in the bid, then we're locking that, it into what? I like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Right. That way we're not locking it into an, an amount. We're but we're locking, locking it, it back to this. We're locking it into what's yeah. actually been bid. Yeah, that, that would work. So what I would do is I would say move the bid, be awarded to Meyer Tree, uh, Meyer Tree Service Inc., and add after that at the various rates specified in the bid, and then pursuant to, is what I would add in there. So we'll actually lock it into what what the rates are. Right. At that point in the bid, and there's no. Then if there's big storms, you don't have to address yeah. it. Right. You don't have to adjust it. That work? Uh, works. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping it'll be less. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you yeah. got it, Tracy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, you can make. You're going to make that as part of the main motion. Yes. Okay. So okay. please read the motion, please. Okay. Move that bid IFB two zero one eight dash eleven four tree trimming services be awarded to Bay Tree Service Inc. at the various rates specified in the bid, pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter thirty section thirty nine M, as the lowest responsible and eligible bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. The one year contract beginning January 1st, 2018, with an RMLD option for two additional one year terms. Okay, is that second? Second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Oppose that motion carries 4 0. On to the next one. Thank you. The next one is the uh, IFB 2018 12 current limiting reactor construction and installation of station 3. If you recall, we got the uh, materials uh, uh, already, we, we had a bid, we are receiving the materials actually pretty soon uh, next week. But the materials were budgeted for 250,000 and the actual uh, came out to 145,000. Uh, and the construction over here, uh, we had a number of bidders uh, uh, that we received a uh, bid, actually, the sealed bid from Mass Bay Electrical Corp, Murphy, Valiant, Electric, and also the power line contractors. And the lowest responsible, responsive bidder was a Mass Bay Electrical Corp for $153,920. It was budgeted for $165,000. So it's well below the bu budget mm -hmm. uh, for both materials and the mm -hmm. construction. So. Uh, and the construction is going to start in uh, in April. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Right. Very good. Okay. Uh, move that bid IFB two zero one eight dash one two four current 
limiting reactor construction and installation at Station 3 be awarded to Mass Bay Electrical Corporation for $153,920 pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30, Section 39M as the lowest responsible and eligible bidder on the recommendation of the General Manager. Is that second? Second. Then move to second discussion. Seen it. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Oppose that motion carries 4 0. Very good. Thank you. Good. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Is there anything under general discussion? Not, uh, our next, we got town meeting on Monday, which is we're going we're to make a presentation. Our next uh, regular meeting is December the 14th. Uh, we do need somebody to cover for the CAB on November the 15th. Uh, on that oh. on December the 13th uh, well this is somebody going to cover for the November the 15th meeting of the CAB let me just check I'm just checking here too 15th ah, I, I cannot do the 15th I'm tied up that night already myself that's next Wednesday. Maybe you can reach out to us, Tracy, tomorrow, just to. Um, not tomorrow. Oh, but yeah, Monday. 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 Okay. Dave may be an option too if he's back from the rain Back from Brazil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can just send us a picture. We can put that out. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's done a great job tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you take him with you? <laughs> Save us the time. We'll right. just leave it here and we'll. Great. Yeah. Are you going to be here? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session? Uh, motion to adjourn to move into executive session. No, 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 no. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Oh, Read what's okay. in the agenda. Sorry, I'm sorry. Read Mr. what's Chair, in the agenda. My apologies. Read what's in the agenda. Both of the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Okay. Is is that second? Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. I'll oh, forget to pull the one. Mr. O'Rourke. Mr. O'Rourke, aye. See you know Hennessy, aye. Hennessy, Mr. Stempak. Mr. Stempak, aye. Okay, very good. And we'll adjourn to the uh, other room. Oh, yeah. I mean, December 14th is our next. Oh, wait,